Okay, now, I may, you may ask a question, and I may say, if you'll wait, we're going to cover that the next lesson. I just finished with John and Angela and Destiny, and it seemed like Angela was always one lesson ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, pastor, this and that. I said, yeah, we're going to talk about that next lesson. <laughs> so I may, I'm not trying to put off any questions. Uh, anybody that, uh, any questions you have, I, before we're done with this, I will try, try to answer uh, any question that you have. Now, I may not always have the answer. And so I'll be honest with you. I'll say, I, uh, I'm not sure, but Jim's going to find out by next week. So, <laughs> so come on in. Good to see you, Amy. Yeah, you can fold that up if you want now. I was just to illustrate. Mike, why don't you shift on up here and let Amy sit there. Amy, you sit there beside Brianna. So great to have everybody tonight. And are you ready, Brandon? Sir. Okay, so uh, this Bible study is called Search for Truth, and that's what it is. It's a search for truth. Now, we're going to use this, the chart to keep us on track, okay, and the outline to try to keep us on subject, but what we're really going to study is the Bible. This, this is a Bible study, and so uh, kind of the theme scripture is John 5 and 39, where Christ said, Search the Scriptures, for they are they which testify of me, and in them you think you have eternal life. So, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to search the Scriptures. If you don't have your Bible tonight, bring your Bible with you. If you got a phone, uh, you know, you can look it up on the phone. That's fine. I may ask you to, or for volunteers, or ask you to look up a Scripture or two as we go along here. So, uh, I'm going to try to hit the main scriptures and the main themes. Any scriptures we don't look up, you got here on your outline, and you can kind of look them up. We're going to do this every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. So y'all can just mark that down. Tuesday night at 7, I'm going to be here. Okay? So let's just have a word of prayer, and we'll get started tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity just to share the word of God. Lord, we believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, and I believe that all scriptures were given by inspiration of God. And I believe you, Lord, to speak to our hearts and lives and lead us in this search for truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the scripture themselves, uh, how we receive the Bible. You know, your Bible is split into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, the Old Testament makes up really about three-fourths of your Bible, and the New Testament is about the last fourth of it. Okay, in the Old Testament, there are 39 books. Easy way to remember that. There's three letters in Old, nine letters in Testament. 39 books in the Old Testament. They're broken up into five basic parts, the law which is the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. The Jews call this the Pentateuch, okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, the next 12 books is, is a lot of the history of the kings and battles and events of Israel. Uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Okay, so then right in the middle of the Old Testament, is five books that is labeled as poetry. Now, if we spoke Hebrew, anybody here speak Hebrew? I didn't think so. I don't know. <laughs> but if, if we actually spoke Hebrew, you know, a lot of the Psalms are actually songs and hymns, and they would sound a whole lot like poetry, and some of them do. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And, you know, very beautiful literature. Okay, the five books in the middle of the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Okay, they're called poetry. And again, they're not all rhyme and rhythm, but, but some of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible here. Okay, the last 17 books of the Old Testament is the Prophets. You have five major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Lamentations, which is also written by Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So I guess they call them major prophets because these books are just a little longer, a little more in depth. And then you have 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Uh, so when I was a new convert, I had a guy play a trick on me. He said, have you read the book of Hezekiah? I said, yeah, yeah, I was reading that. He said, that's funny. He said, it's not a book of the Bible. He said, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like some of these, though. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. Okay, who wants to look up a scripture? First scripture. Don't everybody jump at once. Jimmy, they're in 2 Peter, the first chapter, and the 21st verse. Okay, the Old Testament was written uh, over a period of approximately 3,600 years, and there's 32 different writers that God used. There's many writers, but there's really only one author. Second Peter 1 and 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so the prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of old were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Spirit of God inspired the scriptures. Okay, now, you know, we got all this modern technology and stuff now. Things have changed a little bit, but go back 20, 30 years ago, and you got the president of a corporation. He's got his own private secretary, and he'll, he'll call his secretary and say, come in here and take a letter. And of course, now we got, you know, email and all this now, and you just send it directly, but take a letter. And he would dictate his thoughts and she would write them down, go and type up the letter, bring it back for his approval. Okay, she wrote it down, right? But he spoke it. It was his letter. She just recorded it. And that's how we got the scripture. God inspired these prophets and ancient men. They just wrote it down, thank God. Because you realize the law of Moses is 3,500 years old now. And we still have a record of the law of Moses and the first five books of the Bible. I'm glad they wrote it down and, and that we have God's word uh, recorded for all history now so that we can today even. And it's, it's astounding. Even though there's a lot of things in the law in the Old Testament that are not um, maybe really applicable today, a lot of blood sacrifices and a lot of rituals in the law. But still, you read the first five books of the Bible, it's, it's still, it makes sense. See what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's, it's not like it's just a bunch of rambling and incoherent literature. No, man, it's, it's perfectly laid out. And you'll find this as the Bible. The Bible proves itself to be true. And that is one of the main themes of this first lesson is that that this is God's word. Okay, a couple more scriptures here real quick. Uh, volunteers. All right, Mike, come on, don't let these guys do all this here. Uh, am I getting ahead of myself? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think that's lesson. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, um, Psalms 19. I know what it is, whether I can find it on that page or not. First four verses. Okay, so before we had the written word, God literally would speak to people. You know, Abraham was before the book, of, well, he wasn't before the book of Genesis, but he, he was before the book of Genesis was written. Moses was after Abraham, and Moses wrote the book of Genesis. I mean, God spoke to Abraham. Said, get thee out of the Ur of Chaldees to a land I will show you. He spoke to them. And so God spoke literally, orally. God speaks through creation. Psalms 19, the first four verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Okay, 
Day unto day utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. Now, I don't know about you, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm an outdoor person. I can't call myself an environmentalist or somebody like that, but creation speaks to me. All I gotta do is walk outside and look up at the stars and it tells me that there's a God in heaven. This all, this all didn't just happen. You know, and I love the creation, you know, except for the curse and the people on it that create so many problems. Uh, the earth is a beautiful creation. The earth itself, even now, is a beautiful creation, is it not? And, and so day unto day utter speak, night unto night show with knowledge. God speaks through creation. And then God speaks through conscience. Somebody say amen to that. You know, even before the written word, God would speak to them uh, in their hearts and their minds. Well, he still does that today, only he uses his word also. But the first written covenant, and of course, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. But not only did he give him the Ten Commandments, he gave him the first five books of the law. Now think, think of the tremendous, you know, put Moses on an ancient mountain. Mount Sinai is in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are actually twin mountains. There is nothing out there, nothing out there. It's a desert. It's barren. And here's Moses on top of this mountain, and God gives him those first five books. And you read those first five books, and that's pretty astounding. God gave Moses the account of the creation. You know, the Bible is not a science book. The Bible is not a medical journal. It's, you know... Uh, but it gives us an account of creation. And it shares with us a lot of insights, and we're going to get into some more of this a little later, that, that how God used his word to, to not just give people spiritual commandments. You understand Israel was governed by the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, for hundreds of years. That was their law and their government. You know, and you read those first, and they are intelligent. It wasn't some ignorant guy out there in the wilderness writing a bunch of foolish stuff. You read those first five books of the Bible, and they make a lot of sense. And so it was inspired by God. Okay, so to preserve the law, the, the Jews would take the law, and they put it in the Ark of the Covenant and preserved it there, meticulously preserved it. Uh, the Jews were really, really, you know, very um, precise about this. Uh, the scribes, scribes, scribble, writers, scribes, writers, okay? The scribes, their, their job was to make copies of the law of Moses. That was their job. We went to the Dead Sea, the area of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's a place out there that the Jews still have, and there is a scribe on duty, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I take that back. They probably take the Sabbath off, known the Jews. They're still out there making copies of, if I had my wallet, I'd show you the, the scribe for $1, the scribe wrote a little one-by-one one thing that's in Jew, in Hebrew that says Ron and Shar. That's my wife. <laughs> but there's, there's still a scribe on duty in the Dead Sea area, and they're still making copies handwritten copies of the law of Moses. They, they were so meticulous, they would take a section of, of the law and they would, they would look at the word, they would say the word, they would write the word, they would say it again, and then they would look at it, okay? And then they would, every section they had laid out, they knew exactly how many words and how many letters were in each section. And if they would copy a section by hand, you understand, no print presses yet, by hand, and there was one letter missing. Just tear it up and throw it away. Start over again. They wanted it to be exactly like God gave Moses. Okay, now I'm not against all the new modern translations of the Bible. Some of them are pretty neat and insightful, but I'm telling you, the Jews were meticulous about this is God's word, this is God's law. Remember, Jesus said not one jot nor tittle of the law would pass away. That means we would say 
dot every I, cross every T. That's a dot and a tittle, a jot and a tittle. You know, that's what it meant. They, they did it exactly like God gave it to them. And that way they preserved the law of Moses, just like God gave it to them for th- hundreds and even thousands of years. Okay, so uh, every seven years, I love this one. Every seven years there was a special event, and they would gather all the children of Israel together, and the high priest would get out the law of Moses, and he would read the first five books of the Bible. How would you like to go to church one Sunday and say, okay, today we're reading the first five books of the Bible. Everybody stand. (laughs) Once every seven years, they read it from end to end for everybody. Okay, so uh, the scribes preserved the law of God for future generations. In 1488, the printing press was invented. And what's the first thing they printed on the printing press? Bibles. Poop. Because you realize, 1488, we'll get into this in a lesson of church history in the New Testament. Uh, hardly anybody had a Bible. They would, they would chain the Bibles to the pulpit in, in, in the, the Catholic cathedrals. And, and people like me and you, very, very minuscule chance we would ever own a Bible. They were very rare until they invented the printing press. The printing press was invented in Germany. It's no accident the Great Reformation started in Germany. Because you know what started the Great Reformation? This book right here. When people got the Bible in their own hands and started reading it, it started a spiritual revolution. And I will tell you, it'll do the same thing today if we really get a hold of this thing and start reading it and believing it and practicing it. It would start another spiritual revolution. So I tell people, okay, if you know if you don't have a Bible, uh, you can buy one at the dollar store for one dollar. If you can't afford that, we will give you a Bible. <laughs> Literally, I probably have fifteen Bibles all together. I mean, I got Bibles everywhere. I got both of my parents. The only thing I got of my parents was I got both of their Bibles and a silver dollar that my mom had. That's all I have of my parents. That's all I wanted. I mean, I got both their Bibles. But, but the Bible is common now. That doesn't make it any less truthful or any less valuable. Because it's so commonplace almost now, we just about ignore it. And that's the wrong thing to do. So the Bible. This is how we got God's Word. Okay, so the Bible has been tested throughout history and throughout the generations. Uh, this is before, you know, this chart here was redone around the year 2000. So this is updated, you know, and now it's about 20 years since this chart's been updated. You know, before a lot of the, the really high tech stuff come out in the last five or 10 years, uh, there was more translations of the Bible than any other book on the planet. The Bible is the number one bestseller in the history of the human race. More Bibles have been printed, sold, read than any other book on the planet. Okay, what did did Jesus say in John 24 and 35? Somebody quote it to me. Heaven and earth shall pass away, away, but my word shall not pass away. God has guaranteed that his word. Are you still in 2 Peter 1? No, Jimmy had that. 2 Peter 1, 21, back up to 2 Peter 1 and 16. Okay, so now, especially with um, the modern technologies and stuff, literally the Bible's been translated to every language upon the planet. I know our own organization, you can go pull up tracks in like 60 different languages just by going online. You know, you can just pull up material of all kinds. But God has endured Uh, God has ensured that his word would endure to all generations. Uh, His word has endured, amen, both time and critics. It seems like every generation we got to fight this battle over, is this the inspired word of God or is this just, it's a good book. Got a lot of good stories in it. A lot of good stuff, yeah, but... How many of you believe this is the inspired Word of God? It's more than just stories. It's more than just good stuff, and it is good stuff. 
but this is the inspired Word of God, and it survived. Voltaire was a French scientist back in the 1800s, and somewhere around 1850, uh, excuse me, 18- 18th century, 1700s, somewhere around 1750, he predicted they were they were making such tremendous scientific advancements, man. They were getting so smart back then that he said, by the year 1800, the Bible will be extinct and Christianity will fade from the planet Earth. Well, in 1800, Voltaire had passed away and the Geneva Bible Society bought his house and printed and distributed Bibles in it. <laughs> Voltaire passed away, but God's Word did not pass away. And God has ensured His Word will endure forever. Uh, I mentioned to you already, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My Word will never pass away. Okay, and then read me 2 Peter 1 and 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, so the apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, anybody that is foolish enough to say, oh, Jesus never lived, it's all just a story, they're foolish. I mean, there's thousands of counts of Jesus Christ being on this planet, not just the Bible. Uh, Josephus was a uh, unbelievable Jewish historian and r wrote a lot about uh, Christ and the early Christianity and the Christian church in the Roman Empire. I mean, you know, but Peter said, we were eyewitnesses. We saw it ourselves. Now, the most powerful witness you can get is an eyewitness. Uh, they convicted uh, police officer Chauvin today because he took a video, and everybody could see what happened. You know, there were eyewitnesses there, and then there were eyewitnesses of the video. You can't, you can't deny it, can you? I mean, you know, you got eyewitnesses. You got the most powerful witness in the courtroom. You know, so Peter said we were eyewitnesses. They actually proved in a British courtroom uh, back in the 1970s or 80s that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And the way they did that is you can take the written account of a valid witness. You can prove you got a valid witness and, and this person is, can, can be trusted and that they give an account of an event, then you can use their written testimony in court. So a bunch of British lawyers got together. They went back in history. They proved the apostles were real people. Peter, James, and John, these aren't just... Story, tell, story figures, they were real people. And they proved it, not just from the Bible, but they proved it in history. These people existed. Jesus Christ was on this planet. Peter, James, and John were followers of Christ. And then they took the written accounts of the eyewitnesses and presented them in a court. And the verdict was, yes, indeed, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They proved it in the British courtroom. And so Peter said, we were eyewitnesses. Now those of us who are true believers... How many of you know Jesus Christ is alive? <laughs> I've seen too much. I've experienced too much. I, I, you can't tell me he's not alive. You see, and, and we have seen and heard too much ourselves to let anybody deny it. So the Bible uh, is inspired by God and has endured uh, throughout all these generations. Okay, a couple more scriptures. Let's get on this side of the table. Bo, you've got, you know, you, you, can you find Isaiah in there for me? Just about right in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah 40, verse number 22. Um, Jackie, you want to get Hebrews 11, verse 3. Is it Sunita? Rasina. Rasina. Leviticus. 17.11, Leviticus 17.11. Okay, so despite what some people think, science and medicine actually, there's many things that confirm the truths of the Scripture. Okay, the science, uh, Isaiah 40, verse number 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants right. are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent dwelled in. Okay, so it's talking about God the Creator. 
says it's he that sits above the circle of the earth. Okay, Isaiah was written almost 700 years before Christ. So that makes it 2,700 years ago. Okay, so when Columbus sailed the blue in 1492, what was the de big debate at that time? He'd go off the end of the earth, flat earth. Was the earth flat? In a matter of fact, in Portugal, there's, there was an, an, uh, an obelisk, a, a little monument that said, uh, Ne plus ultra. And, you know, it stood there looking out over the Atlantic Ocean. What Ne plus ultra means is nothing beyond. There's nothing out there. <laughs> you know, this is it. You can see, but there, there's nothing out there. And so the big debate was in, in Columbus's time, 1492. I mean, that's modern times, man. That's only five, six hundred years ago. The big debate was, is the earth flat? And Columbus, you keep sailing west, you're going to drop off the end of the earth out there somewhere. But lo and behold, the earth was not flat, was it? The earth was round. What does that say? First, first sentence. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Isaiah said 2,700 years ago, the circle of the earth. The earth is round. The scripture records it. You know, that God the creator sits above the circle of the earth. Okay, so uh, also, um, make sure I get the right one here. Okay, Hebrews 11, verse number 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Okay, so the things which are seen are made of things which are not visible. Okay, so in other words, everything you can see, everything you can touch, everything that we physically know exists is made of things that you can't see. I asked Brother Jacobs just, just recently, again, Brother Jacobs is in our church and he's a, a, a physics professor, ECU. I said, Have, can, can you see an atom yet? Can you see? He said, no, this, you cannot see an atom. There's no technology they've created. You can't see an atom. They know they're there because of the energy and activity that they create, but you just, you can't see it. But made up of these atoms. Everything that you can see is made up of things you can't see. And Hebrews said that, Hebrews 11 and 3, 2,000 years ago. It didn't take Einstein. It took Einstein to figure it out for us. But God knew it 2,000 years ago. Everything you can see is made of things which you cannot see. Hebrews 11 and 3. Leviticus 17 and 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it un I have given you it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay, the life of your flesh is in your blood. Okay, now he's talking about the atonement specifically here, but he makes a very clear, concise statement. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay, now it used to be, I mean, a couple hundred years ago even, that sometimes a person would get sick and they weren't getting better and they were just staying sick and they say they got bad blood. Let's get that blood out of them. Let's bleed them. And they would sometimes use leeches or sometimes they'd just cut them and let them bleed. They think we get the bad blood out of them, then they'll get better. They don't do that anymore, do they? <laughs> now they take you to the hospital, what are they doing? They're pumping blood in you. They're infusing you with blood. Why? Because the life of your flesh is in the blood. Do you know that every cell in your body, hair cells, fingernail cells, any cell in your body is nourished by your bloodstream? That's how it carries nourishment and oxygen to every cell in your body. And so the life of your flesh is in the blood. Moses said it 3,500 years ago. Another interesting thing uh, in the law was this, that, you know, God commanded the Jews to carry on certain uh, practices. Um, what am I trying to say? Um, hygiene. You know, certain hygiene practices, you know, you take, you take the, your urine and your stool and you take it outside the camp and you bury it outside the camp, okay? 
And why? Because he didn't want disease running rampant through the children of Israel. They didn't know nothing about infectious diseases then. In the law, God would tell, tell a priest, the priest goes and visits uh, one of the people, and this guy's sick, and this guy's got a fever, and he's running a fever. Well, the priest, you know, they didn't have doctors per se, so the priest would kind of minister to him. And then God said, if he had a fever and he's sick, go home. Take a bath, wash your clothes, and stay home the rest of the day. And tomorrow, you can go visit some more people. Now, why did he do that? Because he didn't want him going from tent to tent, spreading infectious diseases, did he? But God wrote that 3,500 years ago. And it wasn't until the last 100 years or 200 years, and we're still trying to persuade people that, you know, this virus can spread from person to person, and some people don't believe it still. But it can, <laughs> I mean, infectious diseases, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, but 3,500 years ago, God's Word put things in His Word, and it just shows that God knew what He was doing. Long before humanity discovered so many things about science and medicine, God already knew it. He already had reasons He did things. So the more you study into this, the more you study into history, the more you study into archaeology, uh, and especially the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, you find out uh, the validity of God's Word. My wife and I were blessed to go to Israel uh, in December of 2019. Praise God, right before uh, the virus broke out about two or three months later. And we're glad we got to make that trip. And, and so they're still just uncovering stuff over there all the time. And we went to one place up by Megiddo. We were at the ancient ruins of the city of Megiddo, which is Armageddon. You know, in the future, the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, and it's amazing, these cities and stuff that they're still uncovering. They discovered something they're calling Abraham's Gate. You know, 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, Abraham left Ur of Chaldees, which would be modern day Iraq, and went up through Syria and came in the northern, uh, the northwest, northeast corner of Israel. And, and, and uh, the area of Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, and came into Israel. And they discovered this archway of some ancient city, and they, haven't even, they don't even know what's behind it yet. They just got this archway kind of uncovered, and they're calling it Abraham's Gate because they said this is the area where Abraham entered the Promised Land. You know, And so the more they discover about history and archaeology, the more they realize how true God's Word is. Okay, the Dead Sea Scrolls was a, a, a huge discovery. Oh, Lord. I should, somebody remind me next week to bring my picture book from Israel. Because I'm going to say this about ten times. I got pictures of this. <laughs> and you can see them a lot better. Come on. Uh, if, if I had the book. Okay, here we go. Yep, I got pictures of it right here. Just pass that around. That is right there in the area of the Dead Sea. You can see those caves in the side of that mountain. Okay, and there's a lot of them. Actually, you can stand down there at the base where they have a, a, a museum like about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you can stand there and probably see a half a dozen caves up in these mountains. And this is right by the Dead Sea, which is a very dry, arid area. And so, what happened with the Dead Sea Scrolls was they, they think when the Romans invaded Israel, there was this group called the Essenes. And matter of fact, that's where the guys are still writing the scrolls is out there where the Essenes uh, used to uh, have their headquarters, per se. So uh, very, very dry area. So the Romans are invading Israel. And so these Essenes say, you know what? These guys allowed to come in here and destroy everything we got. Let's take a bunch of our scriptures. Let's take a bunch of our writing. Let's take a bunch of our literature. Let's gather it up and let's hide it from them. And so they go up into these caves on the side of these mountains in the middle of the desert. And, and they put them in clay pots. And they stick them in the back of these caves. Okay. And so, uh, of course, the Romans ruled and then... The Romans did destroy Jerusalem after Christ was here, and hundreds of years passed, thousands of years passed. So somewhere down the line, after World War II, um, 
there's a lot of shepherds. The Bodin, Bodin, Boyden, what is it? Bedouin. Bedouin. Bedouin <laughs> shepherds. And those guys are still out there. It's crazy, man. Israel's so brown, it's amazing. I mean, it doesn't look like anything grows there hardly. And I don't know what them poor sheep eat. But <laughs> we're driving down the road toward the Dead Sea, and you see these shepherds out there still herding sheep and stuff. So these, some of these shepherds, or shepherd boys, you know, discovered in some of these caves, they discovered all these clay jars, which by now are 2,000 years old. And because it's such a dry area, and because they were inside a cave, and because they were in clay pots, you know, this clay kind of breathes and it preserves stuff real well. And when they open it up now, they're so fragile. Some of them, literally, I mean, they take tweezers and take little sections of it. But there are some of them that were still in scroll form. But, uh, and they, they still haven't interpreted all these Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, but some of them were very legible. They basically have a copy of the whole book of Isaiah. And the whole book of Isaiah almost perfectly preserved. And they took it and they laid it down beside the Hebrew Bible today. And lo and behold, word for word, 2,000 years later. You know, and so it just proved, you know, your Bible wasn't written a couple hundred years ago by a bunch of guys that got together and decided to put some of their thoughts together. Your, your Bible was inspired by God and has endured now for thousands of years. Okay, this is the last page tonight. Anybody got any questions so far? Okay, uh, this will be the last page tonight. Now, one of the unique things about the Bible is the Bible predicts the future, <laughs> and then it happens. That's proof positive there, isn't it? There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the first coming of Christ that have already happened. Real quick here. Uh, let's go around one more time. Patrick. <laughs> I forget my own name sometimes, so don't feel bad. Patrick, if you don't mind. Um, Look, look up Isaiah 7 and 14. Um, who else? Jonathan. Zechariah 11, verse number 12. This is just a couple of examples. And then I'm going to give you what I consider the greatest prophecy in the Bible. Isaiah 7, verse number 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so Isaiah prophesied some 650 years before Christ came to this world. He said, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay, so we know that the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary. You know, and I'll get into the New Testament a little more, but it's vital that we believe in the virgin birth of Christ because that's the only way Jesus is deity. If Jesus is not God or some form of God, he can't save us, can he? And the, and the way that he is deity, the way that he is God, is that he was conceived not by man. He was conceived by a miracle of the Holy Ghost. And so th the prophecy of Isaiah came true. Okay? And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear it. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. Go read the next one. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Okay, perfect. Okay, what's 30 pieces of silver? Oh, well, that's what Judas got. That's what Judas betrayed Christ for, right? right. Mm -hmm. If you think good, weigh my price 30 pieces of silver. Okay, that's what Judas betrayed Christ for. 
Zechariah prophesied this about 500 years before Christ. Okay, then he says, cast the silver to the potter in the house of the Lord. You know, it's, it's, Judas is a sad story. He gets 30 pieces of silver, takes the money. He didn't even go get drunk. He didn't go buy a house. He didn't go buy a new car. He takes that 30 pieces of silver and immediately he is condemned in himself. He didn't even get to enjoy it. Like I said, I'm not promoting you go get drunk or <laughs> go pay for a harlot or something. He didn't do none of that. 30 pieces of silver. Immediately he was condemned in himself. What did he do? He took it back to the temple, the house of the Lord, and told the priest, I can't take this money. And this is blood money. And the priest said, well, we can't take it back because it bought the blood of a man. Judas threw it down, cast it to the potter in the house of the Lord. He threw it down and left. The, the priest took it and he said, we can't keep this money in the treasury because we bought a man with it. They went out and bought the potter's field and buried strangers in it. How's that for a specific? 500 years before it happened, Zechariah said, 30 pieces of silver cast to the potter in the house of the Lord. Very precise, right? Okay, let me give you what I think is the greatest prophecy in the Bible. It's not on your lesson outline. Psalms 22. Psalms 22. Okay, Psalms 22, verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? What's that sound like? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Anybody heard that before? Mm -hmm. Jesus, when he was on the cross. Jesus hanging on the cross. What did he say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, to prove this is a prophecy of Christ, the, the eighth verse, the seventh verse, all they that see him laugh at him in scorn. They shoot out their lip and they shake their heads saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. The enemies of Christ that put him on the cross, they're standing down there and what did they say? He trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Exact words. Only one thing. This sounds like a newspaper account of the crucifixion, but it was written a thousand years before it happened. A thousand years before it happened to prove, again, read the whole chapter because it's all about the prophecy of Christ. The 16th verse, the dogs encompass me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. There's your crucifixion right there. Listen to this, the 18th verse. They parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What did the Roman soldiers do at the foot of the cross? They cast lots for his vesture. Here's David a thousand years before it happened, giving quotes, <laughs> quoting exact words and telling exactly what was going to happen. A thousand years well, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know about you. <laughs> Let alone a thousand years from now. And yet here it is. And it's clear. And it's concise. And it's specific. This isn't just some vague scripture that we try to make it say something we want it to. I mean, this is very, very precise. 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the first coming of Christ. That's how it's come we knew Jesus was the Messiah. Because he fulfilled all those prophecies. What? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh. All those prophecies were fulfilled in Christ. And that's why we say he was the one. We know because of all the prophecies. Okay? They say there's 1,200 prophecies about the second coming of Christ. Now, it hasn't happened yet, but you mark it now. It's 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ, and now 2,000 years from the first coming of Christ to what I believe will be the second coming of Christ. Okay, so there's many prophecies. Uh, let me just get a couple, and we'll be done right here tonight. Anybody still got Isaiah? Should have had Bo hold on to Oh, you're still in Isaiah, aren't you? Isaiah 11 and 12, Patrick. 
11 chapter, 12th verse. Isaiah 11, verse number 12. Um, okay, that'll do. Let me just kick this out there while he's getting that. You know, uh, the immorality, the ungodliness of our generation. Christ himself specifically used two examples several times. The Noah and the flood and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Christ said, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. They bought, they sold, they planted a building until Noah entered onto the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And he said, as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, that's one where he said, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built until the day it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. He used the generation of Noah, and he used Sodom and Gomorrah. And he used them more than once as specific examples of what it would be like at the second coming of Christ. In Noah's time, it says three things in Genesis, the sixth chapter. And we're going to study Noah and the flood in the third, third and fourth lesson. Okay, so there are three things. So number one, uh, said that man's hearts and mind were only evil continually. And praise God for all these wonderful technologies, but it's also opened a Pandora's box for people that want to do evil, they can do it continually, 24 hours a day, man. They never, never shut it off now. And so men's hearts and minds were only evil continually. Number two, it said they corrupted the way of the Lord. Well, you feed your mind with evil, you're going to live a corrupt lifestyle. And then the third thing was, it says, and the earth was filled with violence. And God said, enough. Noah built an ark. And Christ said, as it was, in the day of Noah, so shall it be, the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, you know, the crying sin of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, was homosexuality. Uh, and, and that's in one of the future lessons here too. It, uh, when, when Lot, uh, when the angels came to visit Lot and to get them out of that city, it said that the men of the city came and tried to break into Lot's house. Now, Lot didn't do a very brave thing. Lot said, look, I got two daughters here I'll give you, but you can't have these men. And they said, we don't want your daughters. We want the men. So that just, I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? And they said it, we want to know them, which is a, a scriptural term for have sex with them. So uh, this was the crying sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Christ said, as it was in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be the coming of man, son of man. So we're seeing this repetition of these kinds of sins in our generation. Isaiah 11, verse number 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the depressed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Okay. So here's a prophecy about the restoration of the nation of Israel. You understand, 70 AD, the Romans came in, destroyed Jerusalem, carried the Jews away. From 70 AD to 1948, there was not a nation there called Israel. Now we've all, since we've all been here again, we're used to hearing about the nation of Israel again. It didn't exist for almost 1,900 years. Now you take, you know, Take nations, just take the Indian nations. What's the chances of them 2,000 years later being resurrected and becoming a nation again? Pretty small. What's the chance of any nation after almost 2,000 years somehow being brought back together and restored? And the thing about the Jews is their lifestyle was so unique, they managed to maintain their bloodlines. You talk to a good Jew today, they'll tell you what tribe they're a part of. They know their lineage. They know their bloodlines. And, and so 1,900 years, of course, here comes Adolf Hitler, World War II, the Holocaust, killed 6 million Jews in Europe. And, and, you know, the Jews were trying to get out of there. And there was no place to go. Even the United States, shiploads of Jews came to the United States and they sent some of those shiploads back to Europe and they had nowhere to go, they were stuck. And Hitler captured them, put them in concentration camps, and destroyed six million people, which I think is a, 
most amazing thing in human history, saddest thing, but the most amazing thing in human history was the Holocaust. So 1948, the, the United Nations has been formed. The Jews come to the United Nations and said, we got to have a nation. We got to have a nation. If we don't have a nation, this could happen to us again. You know, the Jews were persecuted in Europe throughout those thousands of years too, not just when Hitler showed up. And so they said, we've got to have our own homeland so that our people have a refuge. If something like this ever happens again, they got somewhere to go. And so in 1948, against all odds, amen, Israel became a nation again. Okay, and, and he said, here's a sign for all the nations. I will gather together the outcast of Israel and the dispersed of the Judah from the four corners of the earth. Does anybody know what is, what is the leading Jewish nation on the earth today? The United States. There's more Jews in the United States than there is Israel. <laughs> but <laughs> Israel has been restored. <laughs> and so there it is. And it's a sign from God. And again, Isaiah prophesied this 2,700 years ago. And it happened generation before us. Okay. But, but it happened in modern times. Okay, so uh, one last scripture. Everybody wants to know about the mark of the beast, so we'll turn to Revelation 13. <laughs> Somebody remind me to bring my picture book from Israel too. Because I, I almost every lesson I make reference to it, it seems like, and I never have it with me. So Revelation 13 chapter says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, pre and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It is the number of man. His number is 600, three score and six. Okay, so 666. Six, six. You know, when I was a kid, we used to think they're going to just slap a big old tattoo on you, you know, 666 six, six on your head. And, and you know, and I, but I always wonder how, how could they keep track of every person on earth? How could they control the whole world? They're doing it, yeah, right now, man. They know where you're at right now. <laughs> Probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. And and the technology's there. I mean, they know who we are. They know where we are, you know. And, and I'm not saying all this technology is evil. It can be used for good, and we need to use it for all the good we can because it's, it's going to be used for evil when, when they want to. And we're already seeing problems with how they use technology to influence our society. So, so uh, while we may not understand everything about the mark of the beast, uh, we do understand that the technology is here to make this possible right now. This is not futuristic anymore, folks. The technologies are here right now that they can govern uh, every person on the planet. You know, they don't send out food stamps anymore. They just send out debits to people's credit cards. You know, when I got the stimulus, I didn't get a stimulus check. I just got a deposit in my bank account, you know, <laughs> right? It's just everything's electronic. It's there. So they know who we are. They know where they are. They, they can govern the whole world if they choose to. It's just a matter of the Antichrist stepping on the scene and taking control of these systems and using them to accomplish what he wants. So while this has not fully happened yet, the technologies are definitely here for it to happen. So my whole point on all this is that, you know, the prophecies about Jesus Christ coming the first time came true, every one of them with pinpoint accuracy and the prophecies about him coming again and things in the future. The last two lessons of this series will be totally on what we call end time prophecy. And so we'll talk a lot about prophecy the last two lessons. Praise God. So you can trust this book. This is God's word. Amen. You can trust this book and what it says. And it's been proven time and time again. And so as we 
go into the future lessons, the coming lessons. Uh, it's important to establish the fact that, you know, we're not just telling stories. These are not just fables. It, th this is God's word we're talking about. And if God's word says it, you can mark it down. You can believe it. Praise God. Any questions tonight about what we've covered? Come on now. All right. Good stuff. I'll be right back here next Tuesday. And next week, we're going to talk about creation, talk about God himself. We're going to talk about the Garden of Eden, what is called the fall of, of humanity, the original sin. And we'll proceed from there. Let's have a word of prayer. Praise God. Thank you tonight, Jesus, for your eternal word. God, and I believe it tonight more and more as time goes on, God, you have proven your word to be true. Let us receive the engrafted word of God into our own hearts and lives. And let us believe, God, your word that the promises of God can be fulfilled in our own salvation and in our own experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. What a great group tonight. I'm so glad you all came. About 20 till 7, I didn't know if anybody was going to show up, but here you are. <laughs> and so this is just the first lesson, and we'll just keep right on going. Again, we're going to do this every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. All right? Anybody else? No questions at all. All right, we'll be set up for next week then. God bless. <laughs>